Welcome. Today we are making a video about how to make a good vegetation railway, in particular an EDGG biodiversity plot. For this purpose we have selected a nice dry grassland complex above Ausserberg in the Rhone Valley in the canton of Valais in Switzerland. Where you make your plot depends on the purpose of your survey, but in the EDG standard sampling our approach is to go to a site and cover as much as of the variability of the grasslands that are present there. So to maximize the, the difference between the plots and have as little variance within the plots. In order to make good railways you also need a relevant literature. So you should carry always the most important determination keys with you to the field. We also need some special keys sometimes. There is for example uh, one for Alche Miller. And I also would like to introduce Ivona Dembic, who is doing this instruction video together with me. And my name is Jürgen Dengler. So now we come to the point where we lay out the 100 square meter in the landscape. If you have a big and homogeneous grassland that's easy, but as you see here the grassland is very structured and heterogeneous and we want to specifically record this mesoxaic patch which is not so big. So we observed where better and where we can put these 100 square meters and we think more or less here it would fit. And I start with the northeast corner and put here this metal pin and a very important point is that where you put the pin you have to be very careful not to destroy the vegetation structure because you want to record it later. So I put it very carefully here without influencing the structure and then we put the tape here and the trick to get a perfect square in the landscape measure the diagonal meaning going from this point straight in the direction of southwest. Uh, direction to 225 and turn the compass until north is with the red arrow. So now I'm sending Ivona to the other direction. So Ivona, please go. More to the left, far more to the left. But now you see the direction is perfect and Ivona has to go 14 meter point 14 which is exactly the diagonal of a 10 by 10 meter square. And again she has to pay attention that she does not destroy the vegetation in the corner. Now we are on the other side where Ivona has put the pin in without destroying the vegetation but the important point is you don't fix the tape there. And now I will send Ivona to one of the other corners and we will roll, roll, she will roll the tape from the roll until 20 meters. I will hold this now here and send Ivona to the other corner. And you see there might also some impediments <laughs> which are not easy to cross for small persons. And I give her a bit more than the 20 meters and then we step by step pull back. It's exactly 20 meters and we have exact right angle where Ivona is. So this is how Ivona fixed the pin in her corner. Now Ivona is fixing the second corner with just turning around the tape one or two times around the pin. But taking care of the vegetation that it's exactly in the corner not changed. Now we are caring for the last corner. So Ivona is again going with the tape, giving it a bit more than 40 meters. Now it's straight and it has a straight right angle and I'm going down. I put it here straight in the corner and you see we have a perfect right angle and we have laid out the big plot now. So for all field sampling you should have a 
pre-prepared form and this is the form for the EEG field sampling and you really should decide before which fields you need and then it's absolutely important in the field that you fill all of them. Don't leave any one empty. So for other projects and EEG field records you might wish to have other fields so decide about that before but when you have them then you have to fill all of them. So now it's important we have pre-numbered the plot but in this specific case, we decided that we do not do as usual the northwest and the southeast corner, but we have decided to represent this vegetation type, which we're interested in more uh, better to use the northeast and the southwest corner. Moreover, as we have seen before, we in this specific case, we twisted the plot by about 10 degrees, so it's not exactly north-south oriented, So in the EGG biodiversity plots, we are sampling grain sizes from one square centimeter up to 100 square meter. And we do this, and that's important with the shoot present method. That means that we record all the plants whose superficial parts are hanging in to the plot. Therefore, it's particularly important for the small plots that we do not move the plants uh, into an unnatural position while sampling, but keep them exactly in this position. This is a challenge for the smallest plot, so the smallest plot should always be recorded from one person, from one uh, angle of uh, vision. So here I am doing that, and the best thing is really to use a folding rule, where you have this uh, one centimeter, so I can really measure from the base, and have to decide which plants are in. I can remove them from top, uh, then I'm sure they are in. So I have to decide, and meanwhile Ivona is writing, so I'm deciding here that these leaves are, these narrow leaves, they are definitely in this first uh, square centimeter, this is Vestuga Rufa. Then I go further down, and I pick here a leaf, which is also in, then I'm sure it's in, and I can also take it out and have a look at it. And I see these very long hairs at the margin, so this is Promus erectus. So we have already two species in the first square centimeter. And now I'm carefully moving down to see what else is there. And I see hanging in at the bottom a leaf like that, and this is Taraxacum Levigatum aggregate. And at the very bottom, if I go at the very bottom, I find here, I can take it out, because I'm sure what it is, and it was in, that is Plantago media. So already four species in the finest grain size of one square centimeter, and now I will carefully look from the side whether I might have overlooked something here. It was also there. That is Ranunculus bulbosus. So, for this first smallest areas, you should not change between the persons. And now Ivona will show you here on the screen how she recorded this. So, she noted down these four species and she indicated with a cross, oh, it's already five, even five species, they are occurring from the edge length of 0.01 meter, which means one square centimeter. So she don't have to do the crosses again for the bigger grain sizes, because it's logical. If you have nested plot sampling, the species will also be in all bigger plots. Okay, now I'm moving to three by three centimeters, and for this grain size, usually it's also the best just to take the folding rule and measure the plant, so maybe not even put it in. Just see whether there's any additional plant and then determine the position at the bottom. You also have to take care of bryophytes and lichens, which might be under the leaf here of... I claim that there's nothing additional. So, this would mean you simply don't have to write anything additional, because there's no additional species. So I now can move on to 10 square centimeters by 10 square centimeters. We have Trifolium alpestre, and we have this grass here, 
and you need then also as a botanist always your hand lens and we should determine the species as precisely as possible so if it's possible determine them at the level of the subspecies or uh, if it's an aggregate at the level of the microspecies and in this case this is Brachypodium rupestre it's a species of the Brachypodium pinatum aggregate but it's important that you then not write Brachypodium pinatum but you write well it's actually this species Brachypodium rupestre which is characteristic for the inner alpine valleys we have now completed and carefully searched the 10 by 10 centimeters or the 0 0.01 square meter and now we switch to the uh, 0.1 square meter which has an edge length of 32 and here the most convenient way to delimit it in the field is really to put this folding rule at the ground and see that it has here at 8 centimeter and here at 72 then you have exactly this size Piratium pilosella, subspecies pilosella, a very frequent species, but we have also a rare species for subcontinental semi dry grasslands, that is Hypocheris maculata. If you find something non flowering, like this violet, yeah, you have different options to do. So you can look around outside, that's often the most effective way to find it in flower or you might be lucky as we in Switzerland and have a flora vegetativa where you can really look it up with the vegetative characters. So I suspect this to be a viola hirta but I can look it up here under the violaceae and otherwise you would have to collect the herbarium specimen to take it home and look it up there. So from 30 by 2 by 32 centimeters, it makes definitely sense that several persons searched the area. And in this case, Ivona found two additional species, so we are now with 17 species. But we believe we are now complete, so Ivona is now taking the folding rule and will lay out the big plot of one square meter. So we have now a nice square meter in the 100 square meter and we'll see which additional species Ivona can find. So I will record this. So we are still in the one square meter but we have now managed to find already 35 species, so far no pryophyte, no lichen, but 35 vascular plant species, but we are going on to find more species. So we indicate here on top, it's the first page of likely two, well if in the end it's three we can change it, but then it is highly important that you enter here the plot ID and who did the protocol. Because in the end to keep record of everything and store everything properly, these forms will be scanned and then you will not know which pages belong together. So now we lay out the 10 square meter corner which has an edge length of 3 meter 16. Usually we would have a second uh, short tape for that but today we forgot that so we are luckily have a 50 meter tape which has 40, uh, 10 meter left and Ivona takes this now here to go to 3 meter 16. Then the next is 6 meter 32. So again, perfect right angle. And we have now the 1 square meter in the 10 square meter and the 100 square meter nested. So I can show it to you. So the important thing, you really have to label the back. So we take paper bags because then the plants are not decaying. You can directly press them. It's important to give the full coat, so including the corner, including the grain size, and indicate 
in which line on the form it is. And also on the form we indicate by a circle around the number that this is something that was collected. And yeah, so the CF, so even the genus is not clear, so it might be pulmonary or centauria, so not even the family. And we take it and I take a comparative sample of the safe Centauria scabiosa. Seems that we are almost done, so for now we try to observe the big plot that 10 square meter mostly from outside, not to tremble it. Oh, here I see still something that's a uh, okay, comparato. Note. In order not to destroy everything before we carefully search for the last tiny species, we do some other stuff. We can use this device, which we will later see for several other purposes as well, to measure the height in a standardized manner. We do this in five randomly selected positions within the plot. You put this device like that, put a disc on top, let it fall, then you hold with the finger here, and then you can just take a folding rule to measure the distance. So the first one is seven centimeters. Then we go to another position, randomly, including unvegetated patches, if there are any. We took the five measurements of the standardized height with the disc. Now we also want to have the maximum height of each of the layers. So the herb layer I took through probably this Bromus erectus inflorescence here is the highest. That has 70 five centimeters and here is another one that's but that's lower or so that's the highest. We also have to take into account the rub layer here, the bonum opulus hanging in. So not forget the the woody species hanging in, that's 135. And finally we have also a tree layer, the squirt hanging in. Uh, we have to estimate it, that's also not so important, so I would say this is about the branches that hang in, it's about 6 meters. Now we had the height and now comes the cover. So if we go to this tree cover, well it's, I'm estimating it's only a few branches hanging in, so that's, I think, uh, maybe 1% for the tree cover. The shrub cover is only this tiny two branches of Vonum that's now less than 1%, so maybe 0.2. And then comes the vegetation cover, uh, the cover of the herb layer, and I walk around to get an impression, eventually adding up all the layers of the herbs, including the young phanerophytes here, well, overall, I think it's not more than 90. The cryptogam layer, so we haven't found any bryophyte or lichen so far. So, before the creeping diagonal, I put zero here. And don't forget to put also the total vegetation. So it's not the actual arithmetic sum of these values, but really, if you put all the layers together, what is covered by that. In this case, I would say it's still something like 90% or 91, so it doesn't make a big difference. But in other cases, it's not the sum. So if you have 50% cryptogam layer and 70% herb layer, it's of course not 120%, but maybe 90 or 95%. So we have here the layers of the vegetation, total vegetation, tree layer, shrub layer, herb layer, cryptogam layer, and now, Equally important are the structural layers, litter, dead wood, and then the surface of the soil. Uh, dead wood, I think, I haven't seen any here, so it's zero. Importantly, also enter a zero and not just leave this field open. So litter, litter is all dead material that is not wood. The litter should always be estimated in a way, if you remove all the living vegetation, how much of the surface of the abiotic soil would be covered. I would say in this case 
it is a bit, but not extremely much. It's mostly just leaves of uh, birch and aspen. So maybe it is uh, around 50%. And then we come to these three layers of the abiotic soil. For that, again, imagine to remove all living plants plus all the litter. And then you look on the surface of the soil. How much of it is fine soil? How much is gravel, which would be the grain size of 2 to 63 millimeters, and how much is bigger particles? So, Ivona, did you see any gravel or stone? No. No, I also not. So, we can check once again. But if we don't see that, we would say zero stones and rocks, zero gravel, and 100% fine soil. So, pay attention that these values always sum up to 100, as it is indicated. So one important thing to note and always to fill is also the layer column. Here you see we mostly left it open because we are in a grassland project where we assume everything is herbaceous mainly, so leaving it open is the herb layer. Everything, only everything else is indicated. So we have here, for the woody species we would also indicate if they are in the herb layer, because they could also be in the tree or the shrub layer, so HL means herb layer. The viburnum is in the shrub layer and the betula pendula is in the tree layer. We would also indicate the bryophytes and the lichens in this column. Now, at these 10 square meter subplots, we make a full relevate. That means we also estimate the cover. And the recommendation for cover estimation is to do it in percent. And do it as precisely as possible. We recommend not to use the traditional brown blanquet scales because they come with a lot of disadvantages when you want to analyze the data and you don't have advantages in recording them. So we recommend just use percentage values. And to assist you in that, you will find in each of our recording forms of the EDGG in the bottom an information what a certain cover in percent means. For example, you can see a cover of 0.01% means a square of one centimeter edge length filled with this species. So that would be a very tiny sample. And that's usually the smallest number we give. To record the cover values, we strongly recommend not to follow the list, but always start with those species which you think are the most abandoned. The reason for this recommendation is if you do a lot of relevance in during the day, you might think, oh, I have recorded this species, but it was not in that plot, but it was in the last plot. And that's a way of double checking. So don't go in the beginning through the list, but first think what is the most frequent species. So I'm now going around and I see a real lot of Promus erectus. There's also quite a bit of Pachypodium copeste so, and Testuca rupa. So from the grasses, those three are the relevant ones. Promus erectus is here. So I would try with 25, so I might change it later. Prahipodium is a bit less. I think we have a lot of this uh, big leaves of Plantago media, but how much is a lot? We have also even more of here the uh, Geratium pilosella square meter or a bit less, maybe 18 percent, 17, something like that. It doesn't matter one percent more or less, so it's important in the final scales or below one percent that you are more precise, because in the end many analyses will be on the log scale, so then it doesn't matter to be very precise for the cost values, but it's important to be precise for the fine value. 87 plus 7 is 94. And we said in total for the herb layer 90, so we have already more than 90. That's okay. It should always or nearly always be more the sum of the individual values than the total values because species are overlapping. So if you have a total cover, herb layer cover of 90, the sums of the individual covers should be around maybe 150 in a mesoxaic grassland. Okay, now we are more or less confident about the frequent species and we are also sure that overall the cover values fit together. Now we can just go through the list and look for the more rare ones. 
The first one on the list is Taraxacum levigatum. I have seen it only uh, two or three specimens in the very beginning. So they were here and they were very tiny. Ivona, did you see them elsewhere? No, no. Ivona also has not seen them elsewhere. So in together they might make up for something like, well, three centimeter edge length. That is 0.01. So for the very small values, it's important to have them more precise and you can also with these values easily estimated. The next one is Gallium boreale. Actually, I have also only seen this specimen here. Ivona, did you see it? So Ivona saw it. Saw another one. Maybe one with two more. Okay, so let's take three times as much as that. That is maybe covering an area of five or six by six centimeters totally. So three times that. So it says. If we have an edge length of 7, it's 0.05, so in total it's 0.1. It's Gallium boreale. Then we have Ranunculus bulbosus. That is a quite frequent species. Ivona, what would you say? How many percent is that? Mm. Five. Five percent? Less. No. Less. I would rather be with three, so let's okay. make a compromise. That's also good if you have several persons, then everyone makes an estimate and then you just take the mean. So one has said five and I said three, so we agree that four is a good estimate. So now we have finished our originally found species estimated their cover. So in the penultimate column, we just gave the covers. And now we are allowed to destroy the plot to find more species. And Ivona is doing what we call the so-called creeping diagonal, really searching carefully between the plants for some small things we might have overlooked. It might also in some cases lead to a change in the cover estimates when we realize that below all the other plants, uh, one species has a lot of leaves and we didn't take them into account. I'm sure Ivona will find some more species. Ah, I told you, she will always find something. Oh, what does she have? Nice fern, Botrychium lunaria. Yeah, so you, it's always something special, despite <laughs> you find it not too rarely in some dry grasslands. So we'll, I will note it and Ivona will continue. And well, for these additional ones, we usually can directly give an estimate. So this is very rare one, tiny specimen. So I give 0 0.001 for Potrichium lunaria. And then comes the important part, which is often forgotten, but your data are completely useless if you forget about the header of your form now you have to fill all this part and don't forget any info piece of information from there so we start with the coordinates in our case i just have a smartphone but which is not overly precise but you can make it more precise by using an app that is gps averaging and i have such an app you can just run this averaging function and then it will take uh, one measurement after the other and you can run it, let it run five minutes and then you get a more precise formation. So you see the individual measurement is three meter precision and the average is already 1.3 meter precision. So I will put it in the corner. So we usually take the measurements from the corner but we will indicate that. And meanwhile I'm doing some other stuff. Okay, so now the Smartphone has averaged the coordinates over nearly 200 measurements and the precision went, became more accurate from originally 3 meters precision to 1.2 meters precision. And now I decide that's sufficient. So it's 46.31917 and the longitude is 7.84748 for the EDG 
field workshops we use always WGS84 in decimal degrees. So it's important that you use decimal degrees and not degrees with minutes and seconds because this cause only trouble because we have to recalculate them. So use decimal degrees and use five decimal places. Anything more does not make sense because it would be a precision of less than one meter and that's not realistic. So another important piece of information is the topography and first of all you need to have the aspect and the inclination of the slope. So you have to decide visually in which direction your slope is falling. So where you have the steepest uh, inclination. I, and I put in this case here just to visualize that and reassure myself this thing in a typical piece in the typical direction. So it's not completely plain here, but Ivona, would you agree that this is yes. more or less right. The right? Then you need to have two pieces of information. The one is the aspect, so the direction of the slope. And uh, here we recommend to use a compass because there are smartphone apps, and, but they are not working often properly. Sometimes they work, sometimes not. Uh, orient the compass here in the direction of this stick and put the N to the, the north arrow and then we see it's 27 degrees. The other thing which goes very nicely with a smartphone, so there are multiple apps, you can measure the inclination and that's really recommendable. Better than with the analogous tools you also have, or this compass also would have a tool for measuring the inclination, but it's really hard to read. So for here I recommend to use a smartphone app. Mine is called Precise Level. And then you have measurements of the angle in three directions, but the main thing is this angle, and you see it here, the value. And I just put it here on the stick. So this stick has really multiple functions. And we have now the information, it's 18 degrees and in an aspect of 27 degrees. So, another thing we can measure with the same device is the soil depth. And the procedure in EDG T plots to standardize it is to have five measurements, always in the middle of the outer lines. I'm trying that with all my weight to go down and then I'm hitting here a rock. Uh, I can put here my finger on the surface and pull it out. And then I use a measuring rule and find it's 15 centimeters. I do this also here in the middle, 58, that's here. Okay, we did the four on the outer margin, so the fifth measurement is really in the center. If you want to be precise, you can put a line here, but uh, I do it approximately. And I hit here the stone just below Hippocaris. And this is now 11.5 centimeters. So that's also why the form has five fields for it. Uh, the one thing is you might make a mistake when calculating the average in the field. Now I have to continue the relief position here. Uh, well, depending on your uh, project, you might have defined a set of relief positions before, which are have a clear definition. We don't have it here, so we would just say it's a, uh, the middle slope. Land use is also important. You really should record that and best you have in your project rules how to do that. In this case, we know it uh, is grazed, so it's, it's extensive grazing, there is no mowing, and I put details, low intensity, large scale cattle pasture. And then we take soil samples from the uppermost 15 centimeters. It's really important that you label them carefully with the plot number, with the corner, mm -hmm. with the date, to be sure if some piece of information is wrong. It's always better to have some redundancy. I take a shower. And so here I don't get people because there's a stone. So I remove the 
biomass like roots and also superficial parts. I take five random places. And I can get a little. And you won't believe we didn't see any bryophyte so far, but now I see one. And that is Abietinella abietina, a very typical moss in the dry grasslands of Europe. So we can add this to our species list now with a low power of 0 0.001. You spend so much time with your plots. They are very valuable for science. They are particularly valuable for potential resurvey. So it's always good if you have money for that. Mark these plots with a magnet. And we use here the system of the Swiss permanent plots. That's a plastic tube with six very strong magnets sealed into it. So that can be very well retrieved with a magnet searching device. And now I make a hole again with this device. So you see it's really very wonderful for many purposes in the plot and you can even defend against nasty dogs or anything else. Wolves, bears, whatever. So I have the hole. I place it in. Very maybe five centimeter above the surface, fill the hole again with some soil. Here we make another cross magnet, bury it, and also where it's in the northeast corner. And then important you check whether really everything is filled, which should be filled in your uh, project. So photo, I made a photo of that. Location, you give a name. We don't know whether it's a national object of grasslands. We make a question mark here. We have instead of the Swiss coordinates, we have the other one, so that's fine. We don't need them. That is all filled, that is all filled, that is filled. Vegetation type, we should give it a field name that will help you later. It's a mesoxeric grassland and it's called Celsius Brachypodion, we believe. That is all field. Remarks, well, that's an optional field. You don't have to fill it. That's if there's something you, which does not fit into the other fields. This looks also good. So, finally, we have also prepared the second corner. Went a bit faster because we didn't uh, take everything by video. So we now carefully check that everything is filled. Now the task is we have the remaining 80 square meters, which were not in one of the two corners. And we will start here at one of, we just take one of the two and start recording additional species. Look carefully and also, of course, look for bryophytes and lichens. And here I find the first species to record, which is Lutzula nivea. Here's a trifolium that is suspicious. Yet another trifolium. Yeah, so this trifolium has very pronounced teeth, so this is trifolium weapons. So now we are nearly at the end. So we searched for maybe half an hour the big plot. We had many plants which we could determine and some which we'll take with us, so they're carefully labeled. The big plot has always the X behind instead of the corner. We additionally indicate the area, the date, and since this one were bryophytes, we also indicate that. But we are not completely at the end. So we have recently decided also to make the 100 square meter plots usable for vegetation classification in cases people want to have the bigger area, so this means we have to give also the species cover value for the big plot. Usually we just average the two corners, but in cases where the value strongly deviates, for example for this aspen here, here it was zero, there it was one, so normally it would get 0.5, we think it's rather maybe seven. Populus tremula lost it again. So only in those cases where the average is not okay. 
And for those species that were only in the big plots, we normally, as a standard, assume they get 0.1. But if they are much less or much, much more, we would indicate that. So I go through it, that is 0.01. That is Rutsula Nivea. That's 0.1, that's fine. Trifolium repens is 0.1. Hepatica, that was a bit more, maybe 0.3. The final number of species we will know only when we have entered into the plots, but we might wish to know, and we can take that form of the northeast that has 88 minus uh, 1, which was erased, so it's 87, 110, 100, no. 110, so approximately 110 species in 100 square meter. Thank you.